This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco. Here with John Pluvinage and Michael Wilson discuss their article published in Science Translational Medicine, Transcobalamin Receptor Antibodies in Autoimmune Vitamin B12 Central Deficiency. John and Michael both work at the University of California, San Francisco, Department of Neurology, and we're really excited to welcome them onto the podcast. Thanks, Justin. Thanks so much for having us. I think we all understand the importance of B12 uh, deficiency in both central and nervous system disorders. I think we all have that standard order set when patients are coming to see us. And I think for good reason, right? It's such an important compound for neurological health. But in your introduction, you guys discuss the challenges with interpreting serum values and then this journey it takes from gut to brain, which I don't think we think about as often. Could you guys walk us through some basics around how B12 is absorbed into the body? So B12 is found in animal products, and upon ingestion, it's bound by intrinsic factor in the stomach and then trafficked across the gut's blood barrier by this receptor called the QBAM receptor. Once it gets in the blood, it's either bound by a carrier protein called transcobalamin or by a carrier protein called haptocorin. The former transcobalamin bound B12, which is called holotranscobalamin, is the active form. And this is the form that can be taken up into cells where then B12 is able to participate in all its metabolic reactions. So we have a couple of barriers that we can have. I think people are familiar with that intrinsic factor and intrinsic factor deficiency in patients. How about this delivery into the brain? I know you guys discussed this pathway from blood into the CNS system. How does that work? Yeah, so a lot of the focus previously has been on this gut-to-blood transport. The blood-to-brain transport is a little less worked out, but the receptor that mediates that is called CD320, also called the transcobalamin receptor. And it's responsible for taking up this active form of B12 from the blood and internalizing it at the luminal surface of the blood-brain barrier and then transporting it into the brain. And then you guys talked a little bit about challenges of interpreting serum B12 levels. Is there anything folks should be aware of of that when they're in clinic? I think serum B12 in and of itself can fluctuate a lot. And the confirmatory tests that were taught in medical school are to check a methylmalonic acid or MMA and a homocysteine. These are metabolites that build up downstream of B12 deficiency. So a low or low normal B12 should prompt measurement of methylmalonic acid in the serum. However, I think a key point from our study is that traditional blood tests are unable to detect some forms of B12 deficiency. And in particular, we discovered this autoimmune mechanism that leads to a B12 deficiency specifically in the central nervous system that is undetectable on standard blood tests. John, I think it's a perfect introduction. Can you guys talk about that first index case you guys had that helped lead to this discovery? Yeah, so the whole story started with a 67-year-old woman who presented back in May of 2014 with progressive scanning speech, ataxia, and tremor. She had a very abnormal brain MRI that demonstrated this symmetric bilateral flare hyperintensity in her superior cerebellar peduncles and um, parts of her dorsal brainstem. She was transferred to UCSF and she underwent a really exhaustive workup and everything was normal, except it showed that she had high titers of anti-nuclear, anti-double-stranded DNA and anti-phospholipid antibodies. She continued to clinically worsen. So she was empirically treated with steroids and made a partial recovery. She was eventually diagnosed with lupus and started on hydroxychloroquine. And over the course of years, she started to gradually improve. Can you talk about this discovery of the anti-CD320 antibodies? The patient was, because she was a, a challenging case, with likely with some type of uncharacterized neuroinflammatory disease, she was enrolled in our 
a research study to better understand patients like this. And as part of the battery of tests that we do in the research lab to try to better understand these patients, we used a tool called programmable phage display, which is a method by which you can use bacteriophage to display hundreds of thousands of peptides that are derived from human proteins. And so with that library of phage displaying all these human peptides, you can perform immunoprecipitations where you incubate a patient's spinal fluid or serum that contains antibodies with the phage displaying these human peptides. And after a couple of rounds of immunoprecipitation, you can sequence the phage that have been pulled down by the patient's antibodies and identify what, if any, peptides are are enriched by those patient antibodies. And so that was done with this case, and, and it was John who analyzed this data set and found this very interesting potential antibody against CD320 or the transcobalamin receptor. And in this index case, we found these antibodies using that phage display, which is so interesting. And when we look back, all of her serum markers for B12, the MMA, the other biomarkers that we talked about in terms of B12 deficiency were all normal. But we think that this was impairing that absorption from, again, serum into the CNS. Is that right, John? Yeah, that's right. The case, looking back on it, makes more sense because actually the initial MRI read from the radiologists commented on the symmetry of the MRI findings and urged the clinicians to query metabolic causes. All those metabolic causes, including B12, were queried in the serum, but everything was normal. When we did the phage display and realized that she was developing antibodies against this transcobalamin receptor, after validating that hit, we got really interested in the idea that perhaps this antibody is blocking transport from the blood to the brain. And so, Michael, you guys found this antibody, and I know you guys looked at this in several different cohorts to see if it truly correlated with a certain neurological phenotype. What did you guys find? One of the striking things about these additional cohorts that John looked at, signs and symptoms these patients display are quite varied along a spectrum, just like we think about with traditional vitamin B12 deficiency in terms of the wide range of neurologic manifestations it can have. There were some cases that were equally as dramatic as this index case. There was another patient who in retrospect had very similar MRI findings and also similar symptomatology as this index case. There was there were cases of patients with poorly understood myelopathies involving the dorsolateral columns, as one would expect with a, a B12 deficiency. Then there were patients who were also who we think are potentially pre-symptomatic where they had these antibodies detectable in the blood, but, but didn't necessarily have low levels of B12 in the spinal fluid yet. And so the patients really ran the gamut similar to what's seen with other types of B12 deficiency. But I think that raises that question. I think you're mentioning that the sensitivity specificity. I know we're dealing with small numbers right now, but how did you guys think about that looking in your cohort? Do we think these antibodies, if they're present, are always pathologic? Do we need to interpret them a little bit more cautiously? Again, understanding that we have these small numbers in this initial study. Our calculations of sensitivity and specificity were limited to a cohort of about 130 patients primarily with MS, for whom we had paired serum and CSF. And this pairing of the serum and CSF was really important for these calculations because we wanted to know if they have the antibody in the serum, what is the likelihood that they have a low B12 in the CSF? And in this relatively small cohort that is not neurologically normal, we found that the antibody was about 96% specific for detecting a low B12 in the CSF. And it had a 78% positive predictive value for detecting high MMA in the CSF, a metabolic marker of B12 deficiency. There's a lot of caveats to that. Of course, it's not a normal control cohort. It's a cohort of mainly MS patients. And the clinical significance of the antibody in healthy controls is still a mystery. But the way we're thinking about it is these antibodies, as opposed to other autoimmune encephalitides where the antibody is directly pathogenic to, say, a neuron or another cell type in the brain, We think these antibodies are leading to a second-order effect. First, they're impairing the transport of B12 into the brain, 
And then with enough time, with enough area under the curve, the brain is starved of B12, and that's when you see the manifestations of disease. However, this is speculation at this point, and we're going to need larger cohorts and prospective studies to really tease this out. I think it's a really nice summary, but you guys have really built this story for us, right? We've talked about, from pathophysiology perspective, these antibodies would make sense, right? Impairing that transmission of B12 into the CNS where we know it's needed. It sounds like we're seeing a typical phenotype that we think about with B12 deficiency, dorsal column involvement, the symmetric involvement of other highly metabolic areas in the brain with symptoms matching that. And then some other markers suggesting that there is some deficiency specifically within the CNS. Does that sound like a good summary, John? Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think the one other thing is that in some patients, specifically, for example, the patient who presented with subacute combined degeneration, We think it's possible that this antibody is involved in the primary pathophysiology, but we also are detecting this antibody in a subset of patients with MS, and we're really interested in the idea that in some cases this antibody is not the the primary driver of disease, but perhaps it's a second hit exacerbating disease. And then we didn't even talk about the potential response to immunotherapy. I think you highlight that in the index patient, but what have you guys seen in terms of how immunotherapy have altered some of these cases and improved outcomes? So the index patient was treated with steroids initially, and then more long-term for her lupus, she was treated with hydroxychloroquine. Later on in her clinical course, when we were starting to discover this CD320 autoantibody, she was still being followed at UCSF in the clinic by Dr. Jeff Gelfand, and she was developing worsening word-finding difficulty and other cognitive symptoms. She received uh, B12 supplementation and reported some subjective improvements in her cognitive function. And when we got a follow-up CSF sample, we found that while the antibody was still there, her serum B12 went through the roof as expected with B12 supplementation. But we also saw a pseudo-normalization of her CSF B12 level. There's one other patient who was treated with high doses of B12 supplementation, but this was also in the context of another immunomodulatory treatment. So it's hard to tease out the treatment effect, and I don't think by any means this study shows any efficacy. It's more anecdotal um, evidence that perhaps these are treatments that might be effective in the future. But again, I think larger prospective studies are going to be necessary to figure out how can we best detect this antibody? How can we best identify patients that will benefit from treatment? And what does that treatment look like? Uh, but again, building on that story, you guys have told patients with this autoimmune background, you talked about that potential lupus diagnosis, and then some, again, small numbers with some response in immunotherapy. It's really interesting. Are there other examples where we have autoantibodies targeting metabolic or nutritional markers causing neurological injury? I think this seems to be a little bit of a novel disease, right? We talked in the beginning about, and when we were thinking about antibodies, we're thinking of NMDA receptor or LGI-1 causing neuronal injury, but this is a little bit different. Do we have other examples to think about, Michael, that would help be analogous to this process? I agree. It is a very different model than we're used to thinking about in autoimmune neurology. I think we talk about antithyroid antibodies in the context of neurologic disease, but I think in that case, I think many of us aren't completely convinced that those antibodies are directly pathogenic and more epiphenomenon and are, and are particularly specific for one neurologic condition or another. But yeah, I think this is a pretty different type of model than we traditionally think about across the range of autoimmune and perineoplastic conditions. And it may be the question that everyone's thinking about as they're listening to this and thinking about cases that they haven't been able to figure out. Are some of these tests available commercially? I know you guys talked about some of these research assays that were able to lead to this discovery, but is CSF, B12, or MMA testing commercially available? And if people have want to think about testing for this antibody, how would they go about doing that, John? Unfortunately, it's not clinically available right now. Hopefully in the future it will be. But for right now, we're just testing it in the research environment and the lab, both the antibody and the CSF. Um, But hopefully in the future, it can become clinically available. The one good thing about this antibody is that it seems to be present in the serum whenever it's in the CSF. We think it's probably produced in the periphery. 
So at least detection of the antibody can be performed on a simple blood test rather than a more invasive lumbar puncture. And it looks like we have more to come, right? Some prospective trials and then how this will be seen in a wider population. But this story from bench to bedside, right? These seeing a case and then going through this discovery process and then seeing some changes in the wider population is just really encouraging and it gives us some hope for the field in this world of autoimmune neurology that moves really fast. So thank you both for joining us today, sharing this work. We're excited to have you guys back when we have some updates. You can check out the article published in Science Translational Medicine, Transcobalamin Receptor Antibodies and Autoimmune Vitamin B12 Central Deficiency. John and Michael, thanks again for joining. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, Justin. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.